Welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Mustafa Akyol, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, uh, mainly focusing on the state of liberty in the Muslim world and in Islamic thought. Uh, today, I'm happy to moderate this forum on the brand new book by Professor Kevin Vallier. Do I say the surname right? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. Uh, All the kingdoms of the world own radical religious alternatives to liberalism. Uh, professor Vallier is a, a professor of philosophy at the Bowling Green State University, where he also directs the program in philosophy, politics, economics, and law. Uh, we're really grateful to have him here. Uh, because this is a very timely discussion. Uh, if you've been following the intellectual trends in America, you may have seen that there is a new intellectual movement called the post-liberals. Some of those are... Some of those people call themselves national conservatives. Others are known as Catholic integralists. Uh, and the term integralism comes from the idea that the state and the church should be integrated or reintegrated if they have been separated before. And uh, they have different nuances sometimes, but they all seem to go against uh, and, and want to replace the, the classical liberal tradition that really makes the founding principles of the United States, such as individual liberty, religious freedom, free markets, and the separation of church and state. Uh, principles that we value highly here at Cato, I should say. Uh, Dr. Vallier's books, book covers such anti-liberal doctrines, not just in Christianity, I should say, but also Islam and Confucianism. But his main focus is integralism. And uh, which he takes seriously, but critically. And uh, so we will first in this panel hear some of the key ideas in his book. Uh, then we will hear our, our guest, uh, our second guest, Mark Tooley, who will respond mainly from a Protestant point of view. Uh, he's the president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and the editor of Providence Magazine. We're also lucky to have him here. Then I will respond from an Islamic point of view because the idea, the issue of state and religion and the trend of integralism is also very much an issue in Islam. We have integralists too, we call them Islamists, and they have been actually more successful, uh, but in a catastrophic way, which I'll try to explain a little bit. And there are some lessons, I think, in that story. Uh, then we will have time for questions from the audience uh, from here, and uh, also audience who can join us online uh, from Slido. And then we will have some lunch upstairs. So uh, thank you, Dr. Valia, for joining us today. Uh, now the floor is yours. So please get, give us some introduction to the world of integralists, what their ideas are, what their ambitions are, and how do you judge them? So first of all, thanks to Cato for having me. Uh, thanks to Mustafa for organizing this. Thanks, for, uh, thanks to Mark for you know, us getting to know each other in a couple of uh, different talks and conferences over over time. Um, so what I want to do uh, in my remarks is a couple of things. Since I'm speaking to what's a broadly classical liberal audience, I want to talk about what I regard as some sort of difficulties and challenges that the classical liberalism is facing, and then why this kind of doctrine of integralism has kind of arose. So we'll talk about what it is, where it came from, why it's back. Um, I think it's important to understand the kind of intellectual environment in which young people are growing up. For many classical liberals, liberals and libertarians, when you were young and involved, if you were young and involved, atheism was the order of the day, right? Theism was seen as kind of irrational or embarrassing. I remember being at libertarian stuff 20 years ago, and you know, maybe an objectivist would say, oh, you're irrational or someone, something like that. But today, things are very different. So I do work in philosophy of religion, um, and, and the field is about half theists and half atheists. Uh, you can go on YouTube now, and there's a lot of younger philosophers who um, can watch theists and atheists debate. And one consequence of the new atheists is that they convinced people that theists were so stupid that when they saw theists debate, it discredited the new atheists. Because these debates can be taken to a very high level of sophistication. In fact, maybe even to an absurd level, where people are using uh, Bayesian probability theory and theories of infinities uh, and so on to make to make their case. And many of those philosophers uh, and many of the related academics and apologists are Christians. What this did is it opened an intellectual space 
for kind of smart, young, reflective people to think, oh, well, you know, look, um, maybe I can be a reflective Christian in my political life. It made it easier. Um, not that there wasn't always there, but it, it's a fundamental change at the ground level of young people that now they're no longer embarrassed to be religious. Now they actually, it's easier to have and develop arguments for your views. These kids, I know many of them who are 30, 25 or so, they said, yeah, the theists won the YouTube wars. Like I just, I was watching hours and hours of this. And so one of the things, you know, that I think that's, that's happened as a result of this is that um, I think people, many people are kind of naturally religious and naturally political, like human beings are political animals. Um, but also recent work in the evolution of religion strongly suggests that religion is a kind of human trait. Um, what I mean by that is it's not necessarily expressed by everyone, but it's expressed in basically every society for which we have an archeological or ethnographic record. Classical liberalism was by design usually pretty worried about having too much religion in politics. There's a lot of variation within the tradition. Uh, and for a while, when it looked like the world was secularizing or so on, you know, we could focus on in, uh, intellectual, economic arguments and so on. Um, and so, you know, you could sort of dismiss the religious impulse. It was pretty easy to do. Um, but now I think it's much harder. I think that, um, you know, intellectually reflective religious conviction is, has sort of bounced back. And I think classical liberals don't really know how and don't have the intellectual tools to address these people. You know, I had someone reach out to me, kind of 22-year-old um, uh, secular Jewish student, and he told me something interesting. He's like, I'm very interested in economics, but all my friends want to talk about theology. Why, why would that be? And so I'm trying to tell this story about why I think, you know, classical liberalism was like the radic one of the radicalisms on the right, maybe broadly. Uh, and now I feel like, you know, it's these more religious doctrines that they're the, the avant-garde and so on. So that's a little bit about what's going on. So what is this integralism stuff? Well, it's one of the 200 proof uh, radicalisms um, and it is taken to be a kind of alternative, a radical alternative in denial of liberalism, especially classical liberalism, that attempts to provide an idea, a political ideal, where one can bring one's not just private religious convictions into public, but to fundamentally shape political institutions to promote the true and authentic religious good. Uh, now, there's a number of different ways to think about how this might go. There are Islamic versions. There are kind of sort of moderate anti-liberal positions. Uh, but let me describe uh, uh, for a bit how I uh, define the term and how I understand the term. So it's, you've really got three theses here, two of which basically all Christians can accept, uh, and then the one of the third one, which is, I think, pretty interesting. Um, uh, so so the, the, there are kind of two authorization moments that God engages in, authorizes two institutions. God authorizes the state to promote the temporal common good of the people. God authorizes the church to promote the ultimate spiritual good of the people and to preach the gospel uh, all around the world. Um, the church's end is nobler than that of the state because it's concerned with eternal and not temporal things. Uh, and for many of us, the thought is, okay, that's why they have different goals, so they kind of separated. But what makes the inter for the integralist is they think this fact of the church's superiority has political and constitutional consequences. And those consequences include the idea that the state is in a certain indirect sense the inferior of the church. So when it comes to matters of spiritual affairs, the church can direct Christian states to open its jurisdiction to help back the church's spiritual goals, and also its spiritual penalties. So, you know, one common thing, and this is something that modern day integralists don't have to address, but that was true in the 14th century, um, was that, you know, if the church excommunicated a heretic that was really influential, like uh, the Bohemian Jan Hus, um, if they didn't recant after a certain amount of time, the church would call in its secular arm to impose civil punishments that were added to the sort of ecclesiastical or canonical punishments which at that time include burning heretics alive. Now, you don't have to hold that uh, to be an integralist by any means, but if you kind of look how it functioned, you've got the people being tried in kind of church courts. Maybe that doesn't succeed, and then you've got people being tried or reviewed or punished civilly. Um, and what's interesting about this doctrine, this indirect sovereignty, right? the church can't say, look, people have to eat, so we're going to take over agriculture because they need to eat to go to mass. Right? No. 
You can't do that. So it's not theocracy, right? It's not the total rule of clerics. Um, it's only partial. Uh, this doctrine of indirect sovereignty goes back really far in Catholic history. There's a lot of disputes about, for instance, how to interpret Aquinas' political thought, and I try not to take positions on how to interpret Aquinas because I'm going to enrage some particular sect of Thomists. Um, but Aquinas has this little uh, book, De Regno, and in it, the position, if you read the book, is pretty clearly integralist. Um, I get in trouble with some Catholics for saying this, but because they say, oh, you can't read it in isolation. So you've got basically one of the greatest philosophers in the history of the world who seems sympathetic to this position. Then you go down to the kind of Neo-Thomist revival in the 16th and 17th centuries. Particularly, you'll know them under the name of the School of Salamanca. Many libertarians will know them because of their free market policies. Um, but on religious liberty, there are <laughs> no classical liberals at all. Um, and what they're trying to do is articulate church-state relations in light of the Reformation. They're oftentimes called the counter-Reformation theologians. So the major figures here are Vittoria, um, Francisco Suarez, um, and Cardinal Robert Bellarmine. Uh, Suarez is probably the greatest philosopher of them, but Bellarmine um, is both beatified and a doctor of the church. Very big deal. And Bellarmine defends this doctrine of the indirect, what he called the indirect power of the pope uh, at length. And here, there were two kind of other more extreme positions that were common in Latin Christendom at that time. One is that the king had ecclesiastical authority. This is sometimes called uh, Cesaro papi uh, 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 papacy or Cesaro um, uh, um, in, in the East. It was called Erastianism or Gallicanism uh, in, the, in the West. So that was kind of one extreme of opinion about Pope crown relations. The other is what's sometimes called hierarchy. And it's the view that the Pope has enormous temporal power. For instance, the power to make and unmake kings at will. And Bellarmine's charting a middle course. And so it's very important to understand that the original defenders of integralists were moderates for their day. Bellarmine's writings on this, Pope Sixtus V almost put it on the index of attributed books, which is re re remarkable if you think about it. Um, and so, you know, essentially what you see is centuries and centuries of Catholic history where this is something like or pretty close in the center of the sort of chief political theologies. It becomes infeasible with time. But in the 19th century, there are a number of traditionalist popes trying to push back against the consequences of the French Revolution and different kinds of, uh, say, German, particularly Italian unification. Did they kind of revive this doctrine um, to some degree? I'm thinking particularly here of Pope Pius IX and Pope Leo XIII, although I get in a lot of trouble for calling Leo XIII an integralist, I can defend that. So this is, you know, Leo's pontificate extends it to 1903. And you look at, for instance, the sort of great liberals or quasi-liberals in the church in the, say, 30s or 40s or 50s, uh, like John Courtney Murray, Jacques Maritain, if you look at their early writings, it's integralism they're pushing back against, that they're engaging. This is strange. This view I've described to you is like totally, totally um, bizarre. It doesn't really make, make sense. It seems strange. Um, but you ha must understand uh, its enormous intellectual lineage, uh, the character of the depth of people who were trying to address this position, and how long it was influential uh, in the church. So let me now tell the story of its death and resurrection. For a variety of practical I mean, particularly diplomatic reasons. Um, the church is wanting to kind of set integralism aside, uh, in part because the thought is like, look, um, Catholics demand liberty when they're out of power, but what are they gonna do, restrict liberty when they're in power? And so some people thought, look, this isn't really gonna fly for protecting Catholics and non-Catholic regimes. But there are other reasons too. People are just becoming more sympathetic to universal human rights. So when you get to Vatican II in the early 60s, um, the most controversial document they published was Dignitatis Humanae, which is the Declaration on Religious Freedom. Human dignity. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so there they're using the idea of human dignity to ground what appears to be universal human rights to religious freedom. And so uh, that document, at least by many, was taken to kill integralism. So, okay, it's totally off the boat because it allows for coercive restriction of the freedom of religion of members of the church. So in the meanwhile, and this is how we get 
to the, the modern movement, uh, and then I'll say some things about it, um, was that a number of people after Vatican II thought that sort of Catholics could be an important part, an accepted part as equals in both the international order of human rights, but also in the United States. Um, and so, you know, there were a couple of decades where things looked pretty good for Catholics and Americans sort of getting along. Um, but then, in particular, the LGBT movement um, starts to take off. And there were many Catholics, the conservative Catholics, that kind of felt that, okay, all of a sudden we're kind of, we're going back to the shadows, essentially, in terms of being, being accepted despite what we believe. And I think many young Catholics have never known an America that was, whose elites were, okay, Catholicism, not so bad. And so what some people have suggested um, people like Patrick Deneen, is that actually the attempt to reconcile American and, uh, American Catholicism was never going to work um, because the classical liberalism or the classical liberal tradition, uh, although I don't think it should be exaggerated uh, in terms of its influence at the founding, um, was poisoned from the beginning, these folks said. It was never, never going to work. We were never going to be able to justify American institutions fully and comfortably from a Catholic point of view. And so many young Catholics, I think, were looking around and saying, ah, maybe that's true. Maybe this is the direction under which liberalism unfolds into views on moral issues that are completely uh, at odds with historical Catholic teaching. So I think there was a demand among sort of religious young people for a kind of radical alternative to liberalism. So that explains like, kind of the demand for these views. But we still got this problem of supply. Why, how, did this book, how did this view come back to be something that was on the table. And here the story's pretty interesting. Uh, there are a variety of British Catholics, um, particularly philosopher Thomas Pink at King's College London, um, who were traditionalist Catholics, but they really felt like uh, they were impious, uh, that many traditionalists were impious because they were too oppositional to the hierarchy. In, in many cases, uh, the people that had the traditional view of religious liberty were to some extent in schism um, with the church. And a lot of these integralists said, look, liberalism is poison, but it looks like the current official theology, not maybe the pure dogma of the church, is like kind of, of liberal. But how do we square the contemporary sort of broad liberalism or quasi-liberalism of the church with its very not liberal history? How do we think about continuity between, say, the teachings of Leo XIII and then the teachings of um, the Second Vatican Council? So Pink develops a new interpretation of Dignitatis Humanae, on which the document is purely about the relationship between religion and small groups and the state. And it's not about relation between the individual and the church. That means that Vatican II left off the agenda whether the church could reauthorize the state to serve as a secular arm. So all Dignitatis Humanae was trying to do was to say, well, look, integralism's not really policy in the church anymore, but it could still be right in principle. So the demand and the supply for integralism meet. You've got the demand for an anti-liberalism among many Christians, and particularly Catholics, and now you've got a supply, because now you can say two things. You can say, I'm a loyal son and daughter, son or daughter of the church, and I can reject liberalism hook, line, and sinker. 20 years ago, that was really, uh, for many people, not as available within Catholicism. And so what happens is Pink's doctrines start to make it across the Atlantic, particularly through um, a, a, a priest, Father Edmund Wallstein. And it started to take off, um, but it really took off after Trump was elected. Um, and uh, many of the integralists today, like Harvard Law Professor Adrian Vermeule, are extremely good at marketing these ideas, of, of bringing people into the movement. Um, and really giving many young people not on the left um, what they're kind of hungering for. That classical liberalism doesn't give them by design, right? Classical liberalism is, is saying, look, we don't want an established religion. If there's, you know, many liberals were hostile to religion, um, but, or not, but what they were hostile to was any kind of coercive establishment of religion. And so I think this is one reason that I've, there's been a number of defections from classical liberalism. I, I mean, I know two George Mason economics PhDs that were libertarians that are now either integralists or integralist sympathetic, and they're good friends. I know a philosopher who's a good friend of mine who uh, became an integralist in the last couple of years. 
uh, very well trained, super smart. Um, I talk to young people who, who write to me and they, they, they say, yeah, you know, I found classical liberalism you know, pretty, em pretty empty. Um, all the classical liberals wanted to do was talk about economics. They, all they wanted to do was read me, Mises' human action. They want me to read a 700 page economics treatise. I could go to mass and meet God in the Eucharist. Why, I mean, this is, it's absurd, right? I mean, the idea that libertarians could meet the spiritual needs that people have was not very plausible, to which classical liberals say, yeah, you're not supposed to get meaning in your life from the state, right? Um, but a lot of the younger people I talk to say, yeah, but look, the state is poison right now. It's total poison to the culture. Um, there's no state neutrality. There's no real choice between, say, neutrality and non-neutrality. And so we have two choices, two feasible options, either the woke rule and gradually make our way of life more and more unacceptable and more and more in the shadows, or people who've got the right idea can be in charge. The way I explain it sometimes in a literary sense is imagine Tolkien's world, but you can't destroy the ring. So what's your choice, right? Do you use the ring for good? and try to deal with the potential corrupting effects, or do you let Sauron have it? Those are your choices. Now, most of us would say you can destroy the ring, but integrals like Vermeule say, look, people have been trying to get rid of the administrative state for decades, and it's totally failed. So it's either gonna be used for evil or for good. So let's use it for good. And so I think many young people say, you know, that's probably true. I mean, yeah, these libertarians have been working to try to demolish even stuff like the Department of Education, and they've completely failed, like, they've totally failed. Maybe the modern administrative state is simply part of the landscape. Um, and the, also the idea, particularly with the way that the LGBT movement was embraced in the academy, um, that was the signal to many young people that neutrality was a lie. Uh, and I'm a defender of liberal neutralism, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong, I mean, I've written on it um, in, in a in kind of more contextual, more moderate way. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of the situation we're in. And this is the kind of, I mean, it would be maybe not quite the way to put it. I, it's not quite like a wake up call, but I did want to kind of explain to classical liberals kind of where we are, where a lot of the young people are, what they're thinking, what their culture is, what they want from politics. Um, so they kind of understand um, uh, what's going on. And so just make uh, one final point. You know, when Trump was elected, there was a lot of kind of factions of the new right that had been around but kind of had new energy, right? They could get out there. And a number of these factions, you know, they didn't really have a rich intellectual lineage. And so one of the reasons I think the integralists have done so well is they say, you know, look, we've got a doctrine that can inform all of life, that gives one a sense of ultimate meaning, morality, art, architecture, music, right? Classical liberalism looks so thin and unattractive in comparison. Um, and so that's why I think we are where we are. That's where I think that we are. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of problems with particularly a lot of the way that integralists think about politics, the way they think about economics, the way they think about strategy. Um, so in the book, you know, what I'm doing is I'm trying to make the very best case for integralism first, and then to give uh, a number of different arguments against it. And then you can look at the book and look at those arguments. Um, but some are pretty easy to get across, one of which I gave you, which is that Actually, integralism has a pretty respectable lineage in terms of the teachings and practice of the Catholic Church. I call that the history argument. I've also given you one of the other pro-arguments, what I call the symmetry argument, which is, look, if the church, uh, the state's gonna promote the human good, um, why would they not promote the whole human good, right? I mean, if the state should promote temporal goods, why shouldn't it promote eternal goods, if it can, and if it cooperates with the church who has ultimate authority over the spiritual good? But there's also a couple of obvious problems. The first one that I call the transition argument um, is that the integralist arrangements are so far away from what we have um, that, that to get there, people are stuck in a kind of dilemma of what I call moral feasibility. There are ways to get fiercely ideological regimes to work. Um, and there are some models of this, for instance, uh, with Islamism or fascism or communism. But to do it, there's a whole variety of things you need to do that I think are straight up incompatible with Catholic teaching, um, you know, on, 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 on moral matters. Particularly the process of capturing and stabilizing a modern state that is still reasonably full of people incredibly hostile to you. 
um, that by your own accounts uh, love power um, and are opposed to you in, in every respect. Um, and so I think, you know, you could get to integralism, but you can't do it morally. And if you try to follow moral teachings of, of the Catholic Church, um, it's not feasible to get to integralism today. So I make that argument at length against Adrian Vermeule, who's done a variety of different uh, strategic writings on this matter. But one thing that I did want to say is that I don't think it's enough to say why integralism is wrong, maybe in practice, or why we can't get to it. You know, many people said that socialism was good in theory and bad in practice. And the cool thing about classical liberals is that classical liberals said it's also bad in theory. And so when I criticize integralism, I also argue that it's bad in theory. It sort of can't meet its own requirements in terms of stabilizing itself on the one hand, um, and also uh, having a consistent commitment to justice as Catholics understand justice. There's a kind of richness to these arguments, um, and you know, I've only got another minute or two, um, but you know, they're, they're sort of discussed at length in the book. But the quick slogan on the criticism is, is this. I say, you know, you can't get there, you can't stay there, and it's unfair. So integralism, you can't, it's cheesy, okay, but you, you can't get there, you can't stay there, it's unfair. So you can't get there, you can't transition to it morally. You can't stay there because once you get there, the system will destabilize for a variety of reasons that integralists even acknowledge. And it's unfair in the way that it treats, in particular, its members, because they give religious liberty to non-members, but then they restrict it for members. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a, an outline of the context of the book um, and some of what I, I argue. Most people have been pretty jarred by the fact that I've defended integralism at such length. Um, but I think the only way to address it is to try to understand its richness and intellectual legacy. So, okay, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Kevin. This is wonderful. And uh, I'll give the floor to Mark, but to take a minute before that, uh, what do they exactly... Mm -hmm aim for, I mean, in, if they were given the power to rule the United States, for example, mm -hmm. Adrian Vermeule, yeah. what would he do? Like, what would it look like mm -hmm. for Catholics themselves and for non-Catholics mm -hmm. and for atheists or people mm -hmm. who are blasphemers or apostates? Like, mm -hmm. what's the legal framework and the political structure they, they want to bring in? Yeah, I mean, um, so there's, there's a variety of things one, one might say here. First, there's the stuff they've been public about, and then there's the kind of the things that I think they actually also think. In terms of the public policies they proposed, it's a kind of a radical version of what a lot of Catholic social thought involves today. Um, and, and it's things Catholics have accepted, and even Protestants have in the past. So blasphemy laws. There will be blasphemy. Um, blue laws, um, total ban on any same-sex activity. Um, uh, uh, actually, some of them have been for uh, using executive orders and executive power to ban abortion across the country. Um, so a lot of what they, you know, so, so a lot of these, these claims are, you know, things that, oh, Catholics can sort of say, yeah, those seem like kind of extreme ways of, of getting to it, but maybe those are kind of the right way to go. Uh, they also have kind of more left-wing economic views um, in some respects, even though they're very socially conservative. So they very much like, for instance, the New Deal, um, uh, that particular uh, kind of kind of order. So you'd probably see an expansion of the welfare state, but it'd be kind of a pro-family welfare state. So making, they like to talk about making birth free. But this is all, I mean, relatively anodyne stuff relative to the ideal. Um, and if you, if you were to get to the ideal, um, then I think you start to see something a lot like Islamism, where um, Catholics that are baptized or anyone who's validly baptized comes under the law of the church. And that means as they grow up, they can be subject to a whole variety of kind of legal penalties and then uh, was first spiritual and then civil. They or, can't be cafeteria Catholics. Well, they, I mean, there will be uh, mass requirements that will probably be enforced, I think, um, at least if it were prudent to do so. Um, but also, I think, on the table would be restrictions on apostasy, leaving the church, and uh, restrictions on heresy for promotion of, of kind of faults. Uh, and dangerous ideas under, under certain conditions. I think you'd also have first uh, spiritual and then civil punishments for uh, a variety of kind of serious moral failings that go beyond, say, the things that we would uh, restrict in terms of, um, you know, not just killing the innocent, but, um, you know, <laughs> they want to ban pornography, but I think they'd also ban Calvin's Institutes. I mean, it's all, <laughs> it's all pretty dangerous stuff in terms of confusing people. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, I think there would be pretty serious communications policies. Some integralists have said some really nice things about the Chinese administrative state on the grounds that the Chinese aren't neutralists. They don't care about trying to be neutral. Um, they have very robust ends. They'll just ban for a billion people video games beyond a few hours a day. Uh, and that also the Chinese um, are trying to kind of monitor people to produce moral behavior. And some integralists um, uh, have said, well, you know, they do it in a pretty brutal way, um, but <clears throat> we do need some of these tools to help ensure mm -hmm. that people are protected from certain kinds of, of temptations. So I would think about it something like um, Islamism in certain respects in the sense that uh, members of the faith are subject to a particular a legal code that, that can be ultimately uh, civilly enforced. Um, but also I think there's a lot of thinking about the kind of state power you would need. So but, uh, 10 years ago, a lot of integralists were kind of medievalist. I mean, they wanted to kind of get rid of the state. But once Vermeule converted and brought his scholarship of the administrative state to bear, he started saying, no, we're gonna have the modern administrative state. It's not going away. Um, and we need to essentially exorcise it of liberalism. Is um, it true yeah. one of the prominent integralists said Iran is the right regime just with the wrong religion? Yeah, so this was seen on, on Josiah's blog, which I think they've, they removed but got shared a lot when it was on there. So the thought was, you know, the Islamic approach, yeah, has a lot of virtues uh, in terms of trying to kind of prepare people um, for a spiritual life, uh, but that it was, was the wrong, that it was the wrong religion. Uh, and so there are some important differences, particularly in the, the clear separation of the civil and uh, ecclesiastical powers mm -hmm. um, that you don't see in Islam. So there are some, there are some important differences, um, but there are a lot of similarities. If mm -hmm. you think about Muslims who are within the, mm -hmm. the system uh, the, uh, under the uh, Sharia, um, mm -hmm. I think Catholics under the, the, the sort of uh, canon law would be in a related uh, mm -hmm. position. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Mark, uh, let's get to you. And thank you for joining. And I know you've been writing, thinking about this issue as well, religion and uh, liberty, and you've been critical of, I think, the integralists and the other illiberal Christians. Uh, and what are your thoughts? And, and one question, if the integralists win, what will it look like for the Protestants who are heretics, right? Like, I mean, or other thoughts that you may share, we'll be happy to hear. Or vice versa, if the Protestants win, what's going to happen with the Pro Catholics, let alone others, you know, Muslims, Jews, atheists, and... For Protestants, so that's my short answer to that question. But first of all, just uh, thanks to Kevin for his uh, wonderful work that was uh, so needed and is making a big splash, just setting out non-polemically what integralism is and uh, making the arguments accessible uh, so that uh, all sides can uh, appreciate uh, his work and be more aware of what I think is a, an increasingly growing and important movement. I'll uh, open by sharing a story that I already shared with Mustafa and Kevin last week, which was several years ago in that blur, sometime before the pandemic, you kind of lose track which year that was. But I remember in DC going to uh, a happy hour put on by what I think was the Society of Christian Philosophers. I may not be getting the name correct. And a lot of prominent people were there. Uh, David Brooks was there at the bar, and Ross Duthat was there somewhere in the darkness of that uh, hotel bar. And uh, a young man approached me whom I had met in DC conservative circles before and very enthusiastic. And I said, oh, you know, how are you doing? And he said, oh, well, you, as you know, I used to be a Methodist from Ohio, but now I'm a, a Salazarian integralist. And I was rather taken aback because I never thought I would meet a Salazarian <laughs> integralist or that someone from Ohio who was Methodist would uh, admire the uh, Portuguese dictator from uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, but that was not an unusual anecdote in that in D.C. over the last four or five years, I have commonly encountered very uh, smart, very educated, uh, savvy uh, Catholic young men who are very taken with this integralist movement. And sometimes they're just playing with it and they're being ironic, but sometimes they're taking it uh, very seriously. And I thought at the time, several years ago, if this is influencing and motivating a number of smart young Catholic men, inevitably this is going to happen among smart young Protestant men. And in fact, it did. And I started noticing it uh, maybe two years ago, maybe three years ago uh, among uh, young Calvinists, again, 
usually seminary educated, uh, who liked the themes of integralism, but Protestantized it. And rather than waxing nostalgic about some medieval French king, uh, they romanticized uh, Calvin's Geneva, or maybe Cromwell's Protectorate, or uh, Puritan New England in the 1600s. And uh, unfortunately for them, they lacked the uh, rich legacy that Kevin laid out for Catholic integralism. So it's kind of a, a patchwork of various Calvinist thinkers from the 1500s and 1600s and uh, trying to quote them as though they're definitive and authoritative and uh, relevant for, day, for today. Uh, the only sophisticated articulation for Protestant integralism, which is sometimes called magisterial Protestantism, or some of their proponents simply call it uh, political Protestantism, as though that's the default position for Protestants. The only authoritative or serious resource of late would be um, uh, The Case for Christian Nationalism, written by uh, Stephen Wolf, which I'm sure some of you have read the reviews of that over the last year, over the last year in which Wolf uh, lays out the case for a Protestant, specifically Calvinist, a confessional state that would legally privilege uh, theologically correct Protestants over and above everyone else and punish blasphemy and punish uh, apostasy and uphold the Christian morality and sexuality and in other arenas uh, with the full force of the state and advocating for what he calls a theocratic prince, uh, whatever that may entail, leading society forward. Uh, he opposes uh, voting rights for women um, he got into some uh, racial issues and associations that created a lot of uh, controversy, which he tried to tiptoe out of, uh, but some of that is uh, still there. So uh, to me, as a Protestant and as a Christian, these movements are distressing. And uh, as a way of uh, background, I work for, as mentioned, an institute on religion and democracy, founded during the Cold War 40 years ago to make the Christian case for democracy, human rights, and religious freedom for all people of all faiths. And uh, the intent of our founders then, uh, again, during the Cold War, was primarily against uh, the religious left who were infatuated with liberation theology and with Marxist regimes uh, that were oppressing religion in pursuit of a supposedly more just society. Uh, it was not... Uh, imagined, I don't think, by the founders of our organization that there would be a threat to, on the right by Christians who did not believe in democracy, human rights, and religious freedom for all people. There had been, in that era, something called Christian Reconstructionism, which again was um, eccentric uh, Calvinist thinkers who uh, wanted a, uh, a reformed theocratic state, but again, very marginal. Uh, sometimes people on the left would allege that the new Christian right embodied by Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell were somehow actually Christian Reconstructionists uh, when in fact decidedly they were not. Their, their chief theorist, as I recall, was someone named Francis Schaeffer, a reform thinker who was not uh, a Reconstructionist who basically had an analysis of society in which he advocated for uh, a gradual Christianization of society through democratic reforms, uh, not concluding in uh, theocracy. So why should we be concerned about the integralist or about their Protestant equivalents? They seem like, even though they're more and more prominent, they're numerically few, and it's unimaginable in society today when church affiliation is, of course, declining rapidly, that they would ever conceivably have real political power. Well, I think there are several reasons to be concerned. I know is, uh, from the perspective of my organization, as we've made the case for democracy, human rights, and religious freedom, the Christian case, we chiefly uh, relied on Catholic thinkers uh, to make our arguments. They were the most uh, sophisticated, and they were emerging out of these uh, church documents that began to uh, emerge in the 1960s. They were big admirers of Pope John Paul II and later of um, Benedict. And so uh, as these thinkers uh, pass from the scene and as they are... Uh, potentially displaced or marginalized by others who are less uh, supportive of democracy, human rights, and religious freedom for all people, and even uh, displaced in some cases by persons who are integralist or integralist adjacent or integralist friendly, 
that deprives uh, those of us who want to make the Christian case for democracy of important intellectual leadership because the Protestant world just is not capable at this point in time of providing that kind of leadership with the Protestant denominations largely receding and collapsing and uh, the post-denominational evangelical world full of vitality in many ways, but not having the institutions or the intellectual life uh, to make these arguments. There's also simply the fact that uh, um, the integralist and their Protestant equivalents are not alone in their community in that they do represent a more widespread despair about democracy itself and are opening up all kinds of troubling windows to, well, if democracy doesn't work, what are some other possibilities? And so you hear these arguments for various forms of authoritarianism that again seem extremely unlikely uh, for our American tradition to ever be open to adopting. But nonetheless, it's not helpful to our republic if you have lots of people who no longer believe in the republic and who in constructing or hoping for some alternative begin to become invested in chaos and perhaps even the destruction of that republic. So these are very, I think, socially unhealthy movements uh, that can't be addressed simply by uh, mockery or uh, critique, but really need to be taken seriously and need works like uh, Kevin's and need to be uh, addressed with uh, thoughtful defenses of, uh, and Christian arguments, among others, for democracy, religious freedom, and uh, human rights for all people. I'll conclude just with uh, one more. Well, I'll give you two more anecdotes that indicate where we were. My organization hosted a, uh, a thinker's retreat for uh, post-reformed Calvinist thinkers about a year and a half ago. And at least one person there was uh, very specifically a, quote, magisterial Protestant. And there were a few others there who at least were friendly to that perspective. And there was a prominent Jewish thinker who also was at this gathering because he wanted to make Protestant friends, a name you would all recognize. And um, this one particular individual who is a magisterial Protestant, it was well known that he advocates for a state church, but not national, local state churches. And so the others ask him, under your system in your local community, under the state church, um, would you allow uh, Mormonism? And he said, uh, of course not, it's a false religion. Uh, but the Mormons can worship in their own homes privately. We'll leave them alone. In your community, would you allow mosques to be built? Of course not. That's a false religion. Uh, we can't tolerate it in a Christian society. And then finally, they asked him, uh, in your community, would you allow synagogues to exist? And uh, he would not answer that question. They asked him from several different directions, and that was a question uh, he did not want to respond to. And then finally, I'll share that Two years ago, I was up in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, talking to uh, conservative student groups. And 20 years ago, most of these young people would have been, by default, libertarians, especially the men. Uh, there were none there in these groups. They were all religious. Uh, most of them were really uh, recent converts to religion, and almost all of them are Roman Catholic. And uh, being in Cambridge, uh, they were all very familiar and appreciated Adrian Vermeule. Uh, I don't think they were, many of them were actually integralists, but they were intrigued and they were fascinated by it and they weren't ruling it out. And uh, I found that concerning. Mark, thank you very much. And uh, I'm amazed by the story of the Salazarian yes, integralist that you met. And uh, Kevin, is that true? I mean, Salazar and Franco are kind of ideal regimes for some of them. Is that true? Like they see the, them? This is a kind of difficult question because I think sometimes advocating for Salazar and Franco is a, 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 a little bit of a troll. You know, it's kind of like Can to it? upset, yeah. uh, sort of get people thinking in a, a different way, but also to be kind of hip or whatever. Um, but there are other signs from, from some of them that um, at least those regimes prioritized the church or gave special protection to the church. And what I say in the book is that, you know, on the one hand, you know, there might be virtues of, of democracy, but if you were to compare Franco's regime to Biden's liberal democracy, 
Um, I think there are many integralists who would say that the Franco regime was far from ideal. There were all kinds of problems, but at least on balance, it would be better. So I, it's not so much a preference for the fascism. It's more just um, such a lack of concern for democracy um, and suspicion of it that um, a, a Catholic dictatorship might on various grounds be preferable to a kind of secular democracy. So anyway, I want to be very careful because a lot of people would just say, oh, those integralists are all fascists or whatever, and, and, and that's not fair. But the way they kind of play footsie with, with, with uh, Francoists and uh, Salazar is that at least they had kind of the, the right priorities compared to kind of where we are mm -hmm. now. So the, yeah, there's definitely this flirtation. There's definitely some a few people that are are, are really bought in have, into that. Um, some of it's just kind of trying to upset people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it is really hard for principled integralists to not say that a a, a Catholic non democracy um, is in any way inferior to a secular or liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. So um, you know th there's so much priority on the true religion that giving that up to have democracy is a pretty steep cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why I think they've uh, trended towards uh, that kind of, of friendliness. It's just the logic of their own position. The true religion is the true religion, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. democracy would kind of let people go for it and against it. So if you could stabilize a, uh, a, a dictatorship, it would have certain virtues that democracy lacks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and another question also to Mark. Well, Salazar is gone, but the, the sympathy, affection for a fascination with Orban is maybe a reflection, and even Putin, right? I mean, some people on the right these days. Is that correct? Like, Viktor Orban is the maybe new model for these anti-liberal Christians. Is it correct to say that? Uh, for Orban, yes. There had been some sympathy for Russia and uh, for its uh, increased public role for the church there, but I think once Putin started... Uh, invading countries, that enthusiasm, at least publicly, receded and the emotional energy was channeled towards uh, Orban. Yeah, okay. So Orban is in the model, okay. Uh, well, now my turn to say a few things on, a few things, uh, on this issue. Um, thank you again, Kevin and, and Mark. Um, I mean, I've been noticing integralism recently. I'm not familiar that well with the Catholic political tradition. Uh, and Especially I notice not integralists as such, but the critiques of liberalism by Christians and Patrick Deneen. And I noticed Patrick Deneen not in Christian circles, but in circles I would call Islamist. Because there are people who are called Islamists. I mean, Islamism is a big spectrum, of course. At the most hardcore and brutal land, there is Taliban and there are milder versions of it, but it's basically the idea that, you know, the state should uphold Islam as the true religion, exactly like the state should uphold Catholicism or Catholicism like the true religion. And, of course, the challenge to Islamists, especially intellectually sophisticated ones, is this thing called liberalism, right? It's coming from the West. It's preaching freedom for everybody. Uh, but they're not comfortable with that fully because in their mind there should be apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, the pious should be kept under check and sin should be publicly at least suppressed. And uh, I was having a conversation, with an online conversation with a person who I can call Islam, a smart person. And he said, you're speaking about state neutrality as Patrick Deneen showed, that's a total liberal myth. And I said, well, okay, so let me check this, Patrick. <laughs> so that's how I actually became more interested in this discussion in the past few years. Uh, because although the integralists or the religious radical alternatives to real, uh, liberalism may have utopias that will be hell for each other, they all are joining forces, in a sense, against the idea of a neutral state and individual freedom, right? Because they don't, they don't want that, and that's the... That's the status quo, at least intellectually. So they all want to make an argument against this. And the, oh, liberalism is so bad, it just makes people meaningless and destroys families and all that. And I think the progressive left helps it a lot by pretending to be liberal, but actually being coercive. So I've seen that in Islamic circles a lot. So there's a very interesting angle of these people being picked up by other 
uh, illiberal forces around the world. And I've certainly seen them on some Islamist websites and you know, Twitter feeds and some circles. Now, regarding Islam, just a few thoughts. What is called integralism and Catholicism is pretty much the standard Islamic political model. Uh, in Islam, the classical medieval idea is that the state, the ruler, it could be a caliph, it could be a caliph or a sultan blessed by the caliph, so they're kind of local rulers too. But his duty, his job, and, and his bureaucracy, their mission is to uphold the true religion and enforce its law. The law is the sharia, you know, Islamic legal tradition. And uh, that law is interpreted not by the ruler himself, but by this independent tradition of scholars called the ulama or the scholars, so in a sense, they are similar to the church. They're not as structured as the Catholic church. So there's no pope in Islam. So it's maybe a little bit like Protestantism in that sense. But they maybe, or rabbinical Judaism is a better analogy. But the scholars interpret the sharia and the rulers and the state's job is to implement it and enforce it and protect it and maybe, maybe spread it with conquest or protect it when there's a conquest against you. So it's a war, world of war. That is the model. And the state's legitimacy comes from that. Otherwise, why would the state be legitimate? I mean, what, what's it, what is it protecting? If it's protecting God's law, it's a decent state. Uh, now, in this Sharia framework, your descriptions about integralism sounded very similar to me. Actually, there is some religious freedom. Because uh, in classical Islam, it was accepted. And that's thanks to the Quranic principles of there is no compulsion in religion. It was accepted that Christians and Jews can remain as Jews and Christians, and they can have their churches and synagogues, and they can keep their religion. They didn't have equal rights with Muslims, because true religion has the highest authority. But they were given important rights for that time. And actually, that's why Jews sometimes fled from Christendom to Islam. right? So there was some religious freedom there. But uh, also, there is a lot of uh, coercion on Muslims themselves. As you said, you know, the integralists want to discipline the flock, right? the Catholics. For example, one thing is you're welcome to convert to Islam, but if you convert outside of Islam, no, that's apostasy and that's punishable by death. Uh, second, Muslims were coerced to practice the religion. Like you cannot publicly drink alcohol because you will be flogged for that. If it's Ramadan, you cannot eat out publicly. You, the Hispa forces, religion police will Go out. And that's still implemented today in Iran, right? I mean, in, in, in Afghanistan for sure. Uh, and there are milder religious police forces in countries like Malaysia, uh, Kenya, uh, in a certain part of Indonesia, in the Arab world by and large, with nuances. Uh, so uh, th there are similarities. So the difference in Islam compared to the Catholic integralism is that. We haven't arrived at Vatican II yet. There are arguments for it. There are aspirations for it. There are progressive thinkers or movements. I myself write about that all the time. But a Vatican II shift in the religious tradition, which basically means we accept freedom for everybody. Coercion is wrong in itself. People can be apostates, heretics. We're not going to cherish it, but you know, we're not going to use coercion against it because their dignity allows them free choice and free respect. So that tradition has not, there are pockets for it. I mean, you can say Rashid Ganushi is coming close to that, even from an Islamic, you know. So I'm not trying to make a bleak picture, but from the mainstream conservative, or let alone Islamist position, no, there, are, there is some legitimate coercion in religion, and the state has to uphold true religion. Of course, that's also bad news for Baha'is. <laughs> Actually, Christians and Jews are doing OK. If you are a Baha'i or an atheist, you're in bigger trouble, right? Because Baha'ism is not recognized as one of the traditional religions. And so there are a lot of problems. Uh, so now it's very interesting that arguments of people like Denin, and you say he's not a full-fledged integralist. He doesn't put him themselves. But he's attacking liberalism and giving uh, ammunition to the uh, integralists. And Bermule is an integralist. Now. They are trying to push Catholicism back to pre-Vatican II. And that's why it sounds interesting to Islamists. They say, you see, even the Christians are getting that liberalism is a nonsense. Right? 
even the Christians are realizing this. So there's interesting uh, interaction there. And I think uh, people like the 10 famous Catholic integralists in the US, maybe just five of them, I don't know. There are not too many people, but they may not have the Catholic revolution they hope to achieve in the United States, but they may inspire and encourage a lot of illiberal movements around the world, showing that you know this is not working even they, they know it themselves. Uh, and of course, uh, theory, in, for these kind of radical movements, uh, I mean, America had people who looked at the Soviet Union and said, what a beautiful country, people get free milk or something like that. And they were not living in the Soviet Union. So when people living in a free society, they sometimes get you know, romantically involved in some authoritarian regime out there, try living there. And it's interesting that all these Islamists I converse with, they say liberalism is evil. And I check, wow, they, he lives in London. Oh, he lives in Texas. So they don't go live under the Taliban. But so there's that kind of, I think, pushing for a utopia, trolling about it, provoking and getting interest. And, but actually, when you get there, it may not look good even for yourself, right? I mean, so these people, I think, have that kind of trend. One more thing, I think, an argument we can make against the integralists is it doesn't work, and even for the religion itself. Uh, because by using coercion, you're not achieving a pious society. You are probably achieving a Hippocratical society, a society that may actually detest religion within, although they might be pretending because of the you know, coercion around them. Now, there is a perfect case study for this, and I've written about that a lot, uh, Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Right? Iran is a country very interesting. It's reintegralized. Like, I mean, it had a secular era under the, and it was secular but oppressive secular. And that's one of the problems in Islam. So the secular models didn't come with liberalist liberty, but also coercive measures in themselves. But anyway, it had a secular era under the first Shah and the second Shah. Uh, then Ayatollah Khomeini brought Islam back with a vengeance, right? And they wanted to make Iranian society more pious, more properly Muslim. Hence, you have hijab bans, right? I mean, women are forced to wear the hijab. By the way, the first Shah had forced them to take it off, which was also a similarly bad idea. And I think the French secularists should notice that these days, you know, they're doing the same thing in a milder way, but still the same thing in, in schools. Uh, and there came the reaction to that, right? I mean, so the thing is, though, Iran, everybody, I mean, everybody who is following Iran has noticed this. A lot of people have written about this. Iran has become today the number one country that produces ex-Muslims. The number of people in Iran who convert to Christianity or who become simply atheists is huge. You see this in the Iranian diaspora very clearly. And they're not just ex-Muslims, but also sometimes anti-Islam. And I had conversations with some of those people, and they say, you know, Islam is evil. It did this to my parents, and they put them in jail and tortured them, and so on. When I, he's speaking of Islam, he's actually speaking of the regime. But once they're the same thing, you know, I can understand how it becomes the same thing in his understanding. Also, I mean, we've seen, we see this in social movements in Iran. I mean, women have been burning their hijabs, the headscarves, you know, imposed on them by the, uh, by, the, by the government. In Iran, it's a kind of a famous story that, you know, alcohol is banned by the law, but if you go into people's homes, there are wild parties. There's a lot of bootleg alcohol people produce at homes, and people die out of that. You know, sometimes stories come out of that. So Iran, the Iranian Republic created a lot of power on which the Islamic uh, side serves on. But it really even did they achieve a pious society if that's the goal. And I think that's an argument we can bring to the integralists that, well, you want to ban blasphemy, apostasy, and punish uh, sinful behavior. What do you think what we will achieve? And people will really fall in love with this. Uh, I read a quote in your book uh, by Vermeil. He's saying, actually, people will appreciate coercion over time, right? I mean, I think that, well, I can say it's been tested, tried. It didn't work in the, in the Islamic scene. So maybe that's something the Catholic or the Protestant integralists you know, can, can think as well. Anyway, so these are my thoughts on your great book. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for, you know, 
uh, talking about it here today. Thanks, Mark, for your contribution as well. Now, we have 30 minutes uh, for questions from our audience. That is uh, our guests here uh, in the auditorium, and also people can join uh, online. Uh, for people who will be joining online, I would suggest being on the, writing it, your questions on the event page, Facebook, YouTube, or on Twitter using Cato Events hashtag. I see them here on Slido. I already have a few questions which I'll come to. Um, and if you're going to speaking here in the auditorium, please speak clearly and directly into the microphone uh, so everyone can hear. And please announce your name and affiliation. Thank you. So if you have any question here, I see a gentleman here. Yes, hello, my name is Ben Sperry. I'm from the International Center for uh, Law and Economics, but I'm more speaking on uh, behalf of myself um, as, well, one in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the Reformed Movement. Um, and one thing I've noticed uh, is on Twitter in particular, uh, there is this kind of groundswell that I didn't mean to uh, become aware of uh, called Christian nationalism. Uh, basically because I guess the algorithm thought I'd be interested in it because I like things like uh, regular formed theology stuff. And it does seem to have a lot of uh, mirror images to the Catholic integralism in the sense of uh, the irony, the populism, um, the Protestant Franco or Christian prince in the, in the language of uh, Stephen Wolf that they want to... Uh, have is their ideal. And, and it's, a, it's a kind of interesting, and why I think this book is so great is I think it's, uh, particularly Wolf's case for Christian nationalism, is ripe for an internal critique. Um, because he does pull, uh, much like the integralists do, upon this uh, Protestant magisterium that predates uh, the United States. But there's a strong case to be made that within the Westminster Confessions uh, revisions itself um, that in the Americas very early in the founding period that they actually embrace something very close to a modern religious uh, liberty as part of their documents. And uh, I think this has been uh, a great way to look at it, both to see where they're coming from uh, charitably and, but also then offer that internal critique uh, where really uh, it would be inconsistent with even the American understanding of reform theology to empower the civil magistrate to punish uh, you know, people for deviations from uh, correct thought, basically. Uh, so it, it's uh, a wonderful book, and I just wanted to see if you guys, uh, particularly uh, Professor Vallier, but also uh, Mr. Tooley, had any uh, more thoughts on, on that. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, uh, the Christian nationalism thing is a little complicated because it, I think initially it was kind of a boogeyman term that the, the left was using. And then I think what kind of happened is that there were people who said, well, Maybe it's not so bad. Um, um, and so it's kind of inchoate. And also, Wolf's version was pretty panned by reform, like informed people in uh, reform theological circles. Um, and I've been told by some, uh, a prominent national conservative that there are some more sort of reformed um, Christian nationalist kind of treatises on the way. Um, so I think we're kind of at the beginning of, of the phenomenon. But when you try to kind of talk to Christian nationalists <laughs> now, it's, it's pretty vague. And a lot of the things they want to do are basically things that were the law in, you know, not 1950s. Um, so in one way, I mean, it's pretty, it's not the wolf version, but a lot of what people are advocating is pretty, relative to history, pretty mild. It may be ob objectionable. Um, but oftentimes the Christian nationalists, you know, are really just talking about the kind of stuff the moral majority was talking about. However ob objectionable it is, uh, when you really press them, if you're looking for an ideal theory, then you will get it from a, a handful of people. 
Um, well, the, the Catholic Integrals tab, actually, and this is, this is pretty interesting, is something of a background that distinguishes between an ideal regime and then the kind of practice of the regime. And then to say something like, look, um, yes, the practice of integralism or Christian nationalism is going to be problematic in certain ways, but so is liberalism. And so at least we have a kind of north star, a thing that we want to approach, something to guide our thinking. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so I would say I'm expecting the sort of intellectual seriousness of Christian nationalism to grow. Um, um, but as a kind of popular movement right now, I, I don't see it as having a great deal of, uh, of content. I've even seen people trying to do surveys to get people to uh, see if they're Christian nationalists or not. I've seen some kind of surveys coming from the left and they ask things like, is the US a Christian nation? Like they're polling people on that. And I mean, you know, so, so these aren't very at all sort of extreme or unusual uh, questions. So a lot of it's gonna depend on what the kind of most reflective Christian nationalists wanna say about what they want to say about what the view is and what they want to say about uh, trying to get there. Yeah, if you read uh, Wolf's book, The Case for Christian Nationalism, he's not really much of a nationalist by his own admission. He's certainly not uh, an enthusiast for the United States. Uh, he's sort of a international Calvinist from the 1500s who wants to spread the word and maybe sees a city-state uh, here and there. Uh, their arguments for these Protestant integralists usually are come from thinkers between the mid-1500s and the late 1600s. They kind of stop about 1700, so the United States doesn't even really play a role in their thinking. Uh, but sometimes they'll romanticize the fact that some of the states still had state churches after the Constitution, Connecticut and Massachusetts, and this is a wonderful example for us, but they ignore that these were very, by that time, very rickety institutions uh, that were overthrown by the rising new religious movements in America that were revivalistic and had been restricted by these state churches and had no further use for them. So, uh, yes, I don't, uh, the, uh, the confessional magisterial Protestants uh, who sometimes use the term Christian nationalists really aren't nationalists and they're certainly not enthusiasts for the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, I have one online question, so I want to go one online and one to the audience and, uh, in a second. Here's a question from NQ, and he says, uh, I feel Catholics and their values are attacked constantly and relentlessly. It seems targeted and concerted. Their reaction is not surprising. Do you concur? For your information, for context, I'm a Muslim. Ah, oh, how very interesting. Um, I think it's certainly true that uh, Catholicism gets a whole lot of attacks, um, in part because um, in many ways the right, uh, for a long time, uh, Catholics have had a great deal of influence in conservative intellectual circles. Like less influence on the ground, but a great, a great deal in intellectual circles. And so many of the people making cases for conservative positions um, are Roman Catholics. Um, and so this has often been true, but if you look, for instance, with the LGBT movement, which I think is what kind of made the, the criticisms uh, kind of more fierce, um, because many on the left are analogizing opposing the LGBT movement as opposing civil rights and as equivalent to racism and, and so on, um, is that it was many Roman Catholic thinkers that were making the arguments to resist same-sex marriage. So people like Robbie George at Princeton or or John Finnis, who's maybe the greatest living sort of na Catholic natural law theorist, um, and who's uh, George was his student. So they're out there making the case, and so they get um, really attacked because they're making a case, and they're actually giving arguments um, that are pretty reflective. So I think that was one issue. I also think some of the kind of sex scandals on the ground kind of uh, made it a little bit easier for people to express the hostility they already had. Um, but really, I do see the kind of so the continued pressing of the sort of sexual revolution um, is a source of a lot of the hostility that I think is very much there. And I think the reasons that Catholics get it is because they were the most intellectually prominent and sophisticated defenders of these views. Yeah, coercive left and coercive right are interacting in a, in a vicious cycle, I guess. Uh, there was a question there, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Daniel McCarthy, the uh, editor of Modern Age. Um, the religious aspect of integralism and other post-liberalisms or anti-liberalisms uh, has been the main topic for the discussion here. But there's also um, 
influences on integralism that are coming from less religious directions. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of the thought of Carl Schmitt, for example, uh, the thought of Leo Strauss, among many others. Um, can you say a little bit about uh, the extent to which, you know, what is integralism really all about Catholicism uh, and perhaps these other religious post-liberalisms, are they also really all thoroughly religious or is there a sense in which um, the more authoritarian views perhaps that are coming uh, or being expressed by some of these thinkers have their roots you know, equally or maybe even more so in uh, non-religious thinkers? Um, that, that's a fabulous question on which um, I'll try to be concise, but I may fail because there's so much to say. So if you look at the British integralists like Pink, um, from the beginning, their concern was church reform. I mean, Pink has even said to me, you know, yeah, I don't care about American politics. Um, and if you look at what he's writing now, he's writing essays on how to thoughtfully criticize the Pope um, and how, in many cases, Catholics have a duty to do so. So almost all his writing is what I call church-facing. And there are a number of kind of more intellectual integralists uh, that are on, on, on that side, but they're less, much less intellectually and politically influential. So I think what you're saying is true primarily of the American integralists and those who are oftentimes much more recent converts, um, they're adult converts, like Sarab Omari or um, Adrian Vermeule uh, and Chad Pecknell, I believe, too. Uh, and there, I think you do see the risk of a more instrumentalization. It was really Vermeule who brought Schmidt to the, the movement, which did pre-date uh, him by at least you know five to 10 years. He was a fan of Schmidt before he was a Catholic. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this that Schmidt gives a kind of picture of politics that's particularly well-suited to kind of oppose liberalism. And one is this idea that sort of all human conflict is ultimately theological. And so the thought is, you know, look, we just have um, a fight against people with a, an opposing theological background. Um, and so the way to think about politics is just kind of defeating them. And that's why it, the Catholicism gets de-emphasized, right? Because you just say you, you really focus on the theology or whatever you're against. And then if you buy Schmidt on this kind of friend-enemy distinction in politics, that helps even more, right? So you get more of the anti-liberalism than you get the religion because a lot of the Schmidt helps you to characterize your foe. Um, and to also figure out kind of how to beat them. Another thing I think is important about Schmidt is the sense in which um, the left can be beaten for good, all right? So the idea is we're not just sort of playing footsie with, with the other side by changing ele you know, elections, do Democrats win, Republicans win, or what have you. Um, but much of the promise, you know, once you move in, particularly Schmidt's sort of Nazi period, was even called the crown jurist of the, the Third Reich, um, was this sense among fascists that the conservatives were, were weak because they weren't willing to do what it took to really, say, defeat the communists. Um, and so I also think Schmidt's in there in the sense that it gives people the energy to think, okay, maybe the, the woke can be destroyed, right? We, we don't have to share power with them at all. Um, this is also a reason that uh, Maestra um, becomes an important figure. Um, and on the Hmong integralist, just sort of Maestra's attitude at the French Revolution and his counter-revolutionary approach, much more than Burke. Um, and so um, you know, get more Schmidt than Hayek. Um, and the thought here is that the left is not something to be accommodated um, or cooperated with or compromising with at all, but to be utterly defeated. Um, and so this is why among the movement, I think you know, it's Maestra rather than Burke, it's Schmidt rather than Hayek. Um, and in fact, it, there was an interview in First Things where uh, the interviewer asked Vermeule to recommend books. And he mentions both Schmidt and Maestra in the pretty short list that was given. Um, so that's what I think is, is going. You get so focused on the anti-liberalism and the particular character of utterly crushing liberalism that you're focused on the anti-liberalism more than the, the Catholicism. And that's where I think particularly Schmidt uh, and Maestra uh, enter in. And the, the relationship with the integralists and, and Strauss is um, a lot more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And Kevin, they want to crush the left, but not economically, right? It's, they could be economically themselves a little bit left-leaning, as we see in some of the... Is that correct? Sorry, uh, I, I don't want to be too cynical. I want to, I want to be respectful, but I read this book by Catholic historian uh, James Chapel called Catholic Modern. And one of the ways that the fascists sold themselves to European Catholics was to be for this really big pro-family welfare state. 
on the, to kind of take away some steam from the communists, um, but also to defeat liberalism. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way you kind of built coalitions. And the, the sort of progressives or left liberals or socialists or what have you, they would say, oh, okay, they're not so bad because at least they're against markets or what have you. Um, and so while I think some of the left-wing conviction is sincere, I think a lot of it's strategic. A lot of it's about getting the left to stop worrying about what they're doing. Um, and, and, and so, again, there were earlier America, uh, American integralists, there was a few even, um, to 2013, 2014, that identified as socialists. And you, this, they were kind of influencing, even earlier, the kind of Bernie bro Catholics, you know? Um, but now I think this kind of move to the economic level, I, it's sincere, but it's, it's also very strategic. It's, it, I've even talked to people who are saying, oh, well, at least the integralists aren't libertarians, or, you know, at least they want to talk about the common good in the Constitution. At least they're not originalists or textualists. Um, and so I've even seen it kind of work, um, but this is, this is an older playbook. Okay, yeah. Uh, an online question to Mark. Uh, to the integralist equivalence among Protestants, what would qualify someone as a theologically correct Protestant under their ideal regime, given the many, many disagreements between Protestants themselves? Well, again, the most serious uh, literature of late uh, for quote unquote Christian nationalism is the Stephen Wolf book, The Case for Christian Nationalism. And he says you know, in the early pages of the book, uh, this is for reformed Calvinist Christians who are pedo baptists which means they believe in infant baptism and uh, reject those Christians who only baptize uh, believers who can make their own decisions. So it's a very specific form of Christianity. Uh, he's not talking about, uh, well, obviously the Baptists are problematic for him, uh, the Pentecostals even more so, uh, perhaps the Anglicans, the Lutherans. So it's a pretty narrow subset. <laughs> I mean, liberalism was born to allow them to live together without persecuting each other, right? I mean, so they want to go back to the era before that, basically. Okay, other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, right there. Yeah, Adrian Chogel, uh, retired. You, Kevin, you started by talking, that, uh, by mentioning that the libertarians both only wanted to talk about economics. Switching it back to the uh, integralists, what is the economic ideal, and to what degree is it, is it let's say, a small f fascism, uh, a corporatist state? There are definitely some integralists that are moving or have been open in the uh, corporatist direction. So, um, for instance, um, at their conference in Steubenville, which organization last year, Vermeule was one of the keynote speakers, and he was saying that the New Deal was a massive success. Um, and many of the uh, integralists, so Jonah Goldberg called Amari a pro-life pro New Dealer, and then Amari put that in his handle. Um, so there it definitely is a brace of some more corporatist economic policies, a, a really fierce opposition to markets. Um, although when you look at their actual policies, it's, it's sort of less radical than some of the rhetoric. Um, so yeah, if you look at their economic ideas, it's corporatism, it's protectionism, it's unions, and so on. Now the way this fi figures into Catholic social thought is pretty interesting because, um, you know, the the, the popes uh, have not been libertarians, um, uh, and generally not socialists either. Um, and a lot of Catholic social thought is sort of it's always rejected both, but it tends to be a little bit closer to the kind of classical liberal end on economics than the, the socialist end. For instance, particularly the right of private property is just really central, particularly in the thought of Leo the 13th. Then some of the 20th century popes have gotten kind of more sympathetic to progressive policies in various respects, worries about inequality, uh, universal health care, and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, there is a kind of what you might call economic leftism. But I actually don't think you need to call it leftism. Um, you can just say, look, it's just consistent with a certain kind of Catholic social thought. Um, and their fellow travelers with the left on some issues. But yeah, they definitely favor uh, a large state, a kind of pro-family conservative welfare state, uh, reigning in corporate power, the rebuilding of guilds and unions, and, uh, and so on. Uh, here's an online question, Kevin. Kevin spoke about rules for baptized Christians under an integralist's ideal regime, but could he expand on how much such a regime would legally treat unbaptized people? For example, would a Jew be allowed to marry a Catholic, 
or could Hindus hold public office? Yeah, these are, these are great questions. So we have to distinguish here between how we think integralism would work in practice and then if we're going to look at the view in theory. Um, in practice, I think it's, it's pretty clear that because these religious minorities would be minorities, um, the incentives to dominate them would be you know, considerable. And we see this from integralist uh, history, particularly the treatment of the Jews, um, the popes creating in the papal states, the, the Jewish ghettos, um, won by a, a often lost encyclical, and those existing at well into uh, up until Italian unification. The, it wasn't anti-Semitic exactly as it was uh, worries about bad Jewish ideas. I don't think it ultimately, that distinction ultimately matters um, very much. Um, so in practice, I think, yes, it'd be quite hard on religious minorities. But the idea what they're committed to by principle is different. Because their uh, reinterpretation of Dignitatis Humanae, you read Dignitatis Humanae and it's full of liberties, of press, speech, for families, education, and so on. And Pink's interpretation is that all of those apply with full force to the unbaptized. So in principle and in integralism, there's massive religious liberties for the unbaptized. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's even questions about them having really robust freedom of speech and really robust freedom of the press. Uh, and so I actually think Dignitatis Humanae is still a thorn in the integralist side because if you have any society with a sizable unbaptized minority, they can kind of say and practice as they communicate as they want. Um, so I, at least, so, so, so in what's the answer to the question is, look, well, in, in practice, <laughs> but in theory at least, um, they're supposed to respect the religious liberty of uh, unbaptized groups. Now, the marriage of a baptized to an unbaptized person, I, I'm not read them speaking on that issue. I can see the case for certain kinds of restrictions where you would say, oh, the other person has to convert um, or something along those uh, lines or you know, what one would make of a Hindu community. Um, there's also, though, a kind of ambiguity in the ideal between, well, what if it turns out that uh, a Jews or Hindus or whatever are actually converting people, right? Like, what would happen if those groups started to grow with time? Maybe people became disenchanted with integrals and what have you. Uh, in this case, I think um, those religious liberties would be out. Um, the interesting question, though, is the extent to which the proselytization by unbaptized groups could be limited. So you say, oh, look, you can't, you can't proselytize to, to Catholics. I think they would allow that under certain conditions. But yeah, I don't know about the marriage case. The marriage, that's a really interesting case. We should ask them. You know, yeah, it would be interesting to see, yeah. Uh, another question. There was a question at the back. Uh, yes, one of our Cato colleagues there. Is he? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, the gentleman there, young gentleman there. Hi, um, I'm Faris, a former intern of Mus Mr. Musafa. So I have a question here. Um, there's an Indonesian modernist thinker in the early days of the Republic named Muhammad Nasir. He argued that Indonesia needs a government with a son or Islamic wisdom. Islamic government or government like that doesn't have to follow Islamic caliphate where, um, I'm sorry, Islamic caliphate tradition where the Sultan is the, as a supreme leader. It could be a constitutional republic or like, like America because the Islamic teaching is the most important aspect. And he argued that Islamic teaching guarantee freedom of speech, religion, and he quoted Montgomery Watt that Islam is not merely a religion but an entire civilization. And do you think government with Islamic wisdom or Islam is feasible today? And if yes, what are the challenges? Thank you. Thank you. Is that the question for me, I guess, Faris? Thank you so much. I mean, it, our Islamic uh, thinkers or scholars say that Islam has, of course, religious freedom, and the government is Islamic. There will be perfect religious freedom. But what they mean by the classical jurisprudence is that we will allow Jews and Christians to keep practicing their religion as it has always been. But when you get into the details of uh, can people apostatize, what about blasphemy laws, there are severe limitations on freedom. That's why all the so-called Islamic states in the world today, if they claim to implement the Sharia, there are strong coercive aspects. Now, I think for Muslims, and I think for other believers, the question is, can the state be not defined by, by our religion, but still be a good state that is just and fair and we'll be happy to live under? And limited, I should say, from a limited point of view. 
So is the state can be, because there is the idea that if the state is not based on Islam, it's based on falsehood, and falsehood is evil, the state will be terrible. And of course, they've seen a lot of terrible secular states in the Muslim world too, so it becomes a vicious cycle of thinking like that. I think the virtue of liberalism, classical liberalism, is precisely to argue that the state should protect natural rights equally for everybody, and there's virtue in that, it's good for our religions too. Uh, and, and we have values in our religions, yes, we should uphold them, and they could be reflected on the states, but they're universal values that other people can also understand, and I think that natural law tradition is really important there. And in Islam, denial of the natural law in some schools of thought has been, I think, bad, because then there's good and darkness, and good is on your, only your religion. Outside of that, there's nothing else. So that's what I would say, but we should have another discussion on Islamic integralism on that, but thank you, Faris. So we have five more minutes and other questions here in the audience. There was another question right there in front of two. Um, I was just wondering, we're talking a lot of kind of inward facing domestic policy. Does Catholic, Catholic integralism uh, have anything to say about foreign policy? For instance, we have um, uh, migrants coming in from Latin American countries that are predominantly uh, Catholic, or do they have a different view than typical American ca uh, conservatives towards a migrant situation? Uh, do, does a Catholic, Catholic, Catholic integralist state uh, invade Iraq instead of for, uh, promotion of democracy and promotion of the cross? Can you speak to any of that? Yeah, this is pretty, pretty strange because you don't, I mean, there's some... I can sort of guess from things they said. So I think it was Deneen, Papin, and Amari, maybe, who said, called China a civilizational equal in the New York Times. Um, so I think part of this is that they want a kind of coalition of religious anti-liberalism around the world. Um, and I think that one of the reasons they've been what I call anti-anti-Putin is that it's not so much that they love Putin, but that they want liberalism to lose. Um, and he, they know that if Russia were to win, it would be taken as a loss for liberalism around the world because that's kind of what is encapsulated, uh, what this is. Um, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call them pro-Putin. Pro um, but if you look at like the countries they support, these are ones going against international liberalism. And I think they're very much uh, multipolar. I think they're also, there's an anti-war kind of sentiment that comes out in them wanting the Ukraine war to end or something like that quickly. Um, and so I don't think of them as, as neoconservatives, really. Um, but I think that one of, um, one of the things that's just to end with a, a little joke, um, Vermeule does have a blog post where he says you basically want open borders for Catholics specifically, um, because that will help Catholicize the U.S. Um, I don't know how seriously that was meant. Um, uh, but yeah, you don't see a lot, oftentimes, uh, yeah, they, they have kind of surprising uh, positions. But in foreign policy, what I've seen so far is they kind of want the breakup of liberal internationalism, a return to a kind of multipolar world. They don't, they're not nationalists in the strict sense domestically, but they do think a, a nationalist international order um, has some real virtues over a liberal international order. But sometimes they'll say nice things about, say, a non-liberal international order. Or they'll say, okay, look at how South America has approached human rights versus, say, the United States. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all pretty vague. But the most interesting thing is when they dance around saying nice stuff about the, the Chinese state, um, which is actually pretty, pretty revealing. But yeah, you don't really know exactly what the, the view is. One more question there. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm an ethnic Catholic, not practicing. Um, I think you can't have a discussion without talking about equal rights for women. So the integralists aren't going to make any progress. And is the Catholic Church ever going to make any progress? You mean, uh, I mean, the Catholic Church is a billion people and 5,600 bishops all over the world. There's enormous... Uh, internal diversity uh, to the tradition itself. Um, and I, I think by and large, um, you know, it, it, it's a pr pretty egalitarian in the sense of kind of embracing democracy and, and equal rights for women with respect to politics. The interesting question there is whether you consider pro-life legislation compatible with the equality of women. 
And Catholics argue, what say? Oh, okay, so yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, uh, John Paul II could have reemphasized that the door was, was pretty close on, on that particular issue. There's a further question about the extent to which if people voluntarily join an organization, but it has certain rules, the extent to which it is a inegalitarian. Uh, it's egalitarian in the sense that everyone can join, but it won't be inegalitarian internally. Um, as far as uh, the voting rights of women, I'll, uh, I'll leave that because we're out of time. You're out of time, indeed. Well, we're out of time, indeed. Thank you so much, Kevin and Mark, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for, to, for, to all of you for joining us. Please welcome uh, to lunch upstairs, one floor up, and uh, join me in thanking Kevin and Mark for this great panel. Cheers. Cheers.